Hello everyone, wherever you are, welcome to the Gymnastics WA StarCast. My name is Abid Imam, your host, and we're looking really forward to today's guest. It'll be Janine Murray, who is a 2012 London Olympics uh, competitor in rhythmic gymnastics and also the gold medalist at the 2010 Commonwealth Games in Delhi for the team event in rhythmic gymnastics. So it'll be fantastic to to speak to Janine. And once again, uh, welcome to everyone who's tuning in. And we'd love to see your questions come through on the chat so we can ask Janine. So I'll just make sure we can add her on. Janine is chilling in the green room. And I'll add her right now. Janine Murray shortly. Good to see all the names of everyone coming. If you can tell us where you're tuning in from, that will be fantastic. And Janine's with us. That's very exciting. How are you? I'm good, thanks a bit. How are you? Fantastic, fantastic. So uh, let's get into it because we're, we've, we've received so many questions so far, so it's really exciting. Oh, awesome. Uh, the, first one, the first one is to take it back to the start of your journey. Uh, you were born in Harare, Zimbabwe. Can you tell us about yep. some, of the, uh, some of your memories growing up there? Um, yes, yeah, so that's correct. I was born in Harare, which is the capital city of Zimbabwe. Um, and I lived there till the end of grade six, so until I was 11 turning 12. Um, and to be honest, I mostly have only fantastic memories. Um, it was an awesome place for a childhood. I think um, growing up in Africa is not like growing up anywhere else in the world. Um, and whilst it is obviously a third world country and it doesn't have the same infrastructure that we have here in Australia and the same facilities um, that we do for school and we do for sport, um, it was still um, a pretty, pretty awesome place to grow up. So what sports were you engaging in early on in Zimbabwe? Um, I did a little bit of everything, actually. Um, we had a really good, um, I guess, ethos throughout the, um, the schooling system in Zimbabwe was that um, sport was a big thing for um, both, both in school and out of school. So out of school, I did ballet, I did jazz, I did acrobatics, I obviously did gymnastics. Um, and then in school, I did a lot of athletics. Every term, we'd have to change between swimming or cross country or basketball. So through primary school, um, every day after school, I would do at least one, if not two, sometimes three sports. So yeah, so a bit of everything. Wouldn't say I was good at everything, but I was happy to try everything. <laughs> How did gymnastics come into the frame? Um, so I was doing, um, like, I guess the equivalent of kindy gym, which I think I started when I was about four. And I don't really recall why my parents put me into gymnastics. I just know that my older sister was doing gym and I would assume they felt it was probably a good sport for me to learn some um, basic movements. Um, and I wouldn't say I really loved kindy gym, but I did always have my eye on um, some of the older girls that were doing rhythmic at the time. Um, and then one of my best friends happened to be doing rhythmic and I just went around to her house for a play date one day and she happened to have to go to her gymnastics training. And so her mum said, well, you better go with because I'm not taking you home. And so I went along with her to her rhythmic session. And I think that was that's my memory of my first session and um, didn't look back for quite a number of years. What did you love about rhythmic gymnastics? Um, I think when I was younger, and this is just from my memories, I think it was mostly, you know, all the friends that I was doing it with. And I definitely admired a lot of the, um, the older girls in my squad. So, you know, a lot of those girls would have been three to five years older than me. Um, and I think I really just loved um, their attitude to the sport. They were very good role models for me. Um, and I just, I think I really loved being in their presence and getting to train alongside them. Um, so I'm not, I don't think when I was younger, it was so much the sport itself. It was more the people that I was doing it with. I've actually had a little birdie tell me that you were an incredible runner as well in athletics. Uh. <laughs> so it was a difficult decision between athletics and rhythmic gymnastics. 
Yeah, it was. Um, I did a lot of athletics until I was about 15. So um, I did go to a national championships in Australia for cross country and for um, track and field. Um, and I think the downside on the athletics was I was a little late to mature. So a lot of the other girls my age were a bit bigger and a bit stronger, but that did lend myself better to gymnastics. Um, and so at 15, I did have to make the decision between doing um, athletics or doing gymnastics. And um, I made the decision to go to gymnastics. We received quite a few questions before this interview, so I'll ask the first one. It was yeah. from Monica Costa. The question yep. is, uh, how was the adjustment moving from Zimbabwe to Australia? Well, thanks to Monica for her question. Um, the adjustment was... Um, but look, it was, it, there was times when it was, there was things about it that were easy and there were things about it that were hard. Um, I think in terms of adjusting at, in school was... Um, not, not for me too difficult. Um, I started year seven in Australia and I think that's a year that we're quite used to having change because you, you go into high school in year seven. And so, you know, most of the kids in my year were new to the school as well. So school wise, it didn't seem too big a change because I was expecting to go to high school anyway. Um, but there was a lot of things about Australia that were very different to um, what was back home. Um, and I think the biggest thing was leaving a lot of our you know, closest family behind, um, close friends as well. Um, and knowing that, you know, to this day, I haven't seen some of those people since. Um, and the lifestyle is very different here. There, were, there was lots of really exciting things and lots of things that were a bit daunting. But overall, the adjustment took time, but we got there in the end. Moving to Australia, uh, let's mm. paint a picture about uh, rhythmic gymnastics for you when you were training. Who was your coach? So um, my coach back in Zimbabwe or my coach in Australia? In Australia. In Australia. W when I moved here, um, I did do a talent ID with what was the High Performance Centre. Um, and I um, went into that probably with the wrong mindset. <laughs> which I've subsequently learned. Um, I think I looked at the facilities that they had here and I was um, amazed by the fact that the girls trained on the, um, you know, the correct flooring. They had this amazing high ceiling. You know, it was a floor that I would, had only seen, um, you know, going to big competitions when I was younger. We trained on an artistic floor. We sometimes trained in a hall that was just a mat on concrete floor in Zimbabwe. So, you know, I think I was a little bit overwhelmed by the infrastructure that they had. And so I just instantly thought I wasn't good enough. Um, and I didn't think that I had the right... Um, foundations to be able to sort of compete at a high level in Australia. Um, and I was very wrong because in Zimbabwe, whilst it um, is, uh, doesn't, didn't have this, this, as I said, the same infrastructure, we were very fortunate because the Federation of International Gymnastics actually sent a lot of high level coaches over to Zimbabwe on two year contracts because they wanted to promote the sport in other parts of the world. And so from the age of six, I think I had a Russian coach for two years. I then had a Japanese coach for two years. And then I had a Bulgarian coach, which is Krasi um, Yurikova, who subsequently became my coach later in life as well. And I had her for two years. So for the first six years of my you know, gymnastics training, I had fantastic coaches and I actually got fantastic foundations but when I moved here I didn't really think I did um, and so I decided to go into the level stream despite being offered a place in the high performance program um, I went into levels because um, I think I needed to uh, probably learn a little bit more about uh, my own abilities and my own strengths. Um, and also I wanted to have time to do other sports. I wanted to have time to um, make friends and do other things moving to Australia. And so I trained under Vanessa Kelly. Um, who was linked to Northern Districts. Um, and I trained with her for a couple of years. And then I moved back into the high performance stream when I was 15. And I, you know, uh, joined back forces with Crassy um, again. And she was my coach moving forwards. What a great uh, way to reunite with her. That's a fantastic <laughs> yeah. 
rhythmic gymnastics entails quite a few different apparatus. What's your favourite? Um, I guess I would be very quick to say ribbon. <laughs> um, later in my career, definitely, ribbon was my favourite apparatus. But I think for me, it depended on the routine that was choreographed for me. So um, I, I never really liked ball because if you drop the ball, it always rolled away. It didn't just stay where it landed. At least the other apparatus, for the most part, if you dropped it, it just stayed where, <laughs> where it was. Um, so I didn't love ball. Um, and also um, ball was more about flexibilities. And I guess my strength was more my strength rather than my flexibility. Um, so throughout my career, I'd say ball was, my, was not my favourite, but... I sort of jumped between different apparatuses to what I liked and it would just depend on the routine that was choreographed for me and how well that gelled with me, um, how much I liked the music or I could feel the music and I could move to that music. And um, definitely latterly I had um, what I think was just an awesome ribbon routine. It really gelled with me. I, um, I found it quite easy, to be honest, um, and it, as a result, became my most competitive routine, but one that I just really loved. Moving into getting into big competition now, you made your senior national team debut in 2006. What are your memories from that? So um, that was the start of my second year um, competing in the elite stream in Australia. Um, I, and it was my first year of senior. So um, it was quite surprising actually making the national team. I think it's probably a trend that I had of myself. I never had very high expectations of myself, which lends yourself to always being surprised. Um, and so I... Um, yeah, I think I, I, that was my first year of senior. Um, I was 16 and I placed fourth at nationals and I made the national team. And um, that was something I was really proud of and something that I think um, probably, you know, alerted a lot of the other gymnasts and a lot of the other coaches and maybe judges um, to know that I, you know, that I was competitive, even though I was still really young in the senior competition. You then competed at numerous uh, Rhythmic Gymnastics World Championships. How were those experiences for you? Because we are going to build up to getting to the Commonwealth Games, going to the Olympics. They must have been really formative and really helpful experiences. Yeah, I think um, that's a great way to describe it, as they were definitely formative experiences. And um, each of those World Championships served a different purpose for me. So my first World Championships was in 2009. Um, and I, um, I think the, the purpose for that was just, just to get there, just to qualify. Um, I'd actually had um, a number of injuries that year that um, had set me back a little bit in terms of qualifying for, um, for that event. Um, and in fact, they were probably the, the only major injuries I had in my whole career. And they all happened in one year. And for a while there, qualifying for world champs um, seemed a little out of reach. But I got there in the end. And, and really for that first world championships, it was just about making the team, getting the experience, being over there and it was my first uh, major competition without my own coach there um, and as you said that's a really formative experience it's um, it's a big step to be able to do a competition where you don't have your um, your usual coach alongside you um, so that was in 2009 and then in 2010 the world championships was in um, Moscow and that was only a few weeks before the Delhi Commonwealth Games and um, that competition was very much about us coming together as a team. And I think that was a really great learning curve for me because um, rhythmic is very much an individual sport um, and or, or most of gymnastics is. Um, and so it was good to be able to come together as a team um, because we, we knew going into the Commonwealth Games, it was not about what we came as individuals. It was what about it was 
what we did as a team. And so the World Championships was a great way for us to work together, for us to know that if we each did our individual bests, we would come out as a strong team um, and to prove to some of the other countries that were going forth into the Commonwealth Games to sort of show them what, what we were capable of and what they were up against in a few weeks' time. Um, and then my third World Championships, which was the following year, so 2011 in Montpellier in France, um, that was, again, the purpose of that was to qualify for the Olympics. So again, a very, a, another different purpose, different experience, um, one that ultimately had a good outcome. Um, but yeah, so, so each one, I think each World Championships probably wasn't about being at World Championships, it was about the purpose that it served for the next event. So let's go on 2010 in Moscow because that was the team event and yep. you really did show uh, in the Commonwealth Games that you ended up winning the gold medal. How good was yeah, that? Yeah, we did. Yeah, it yeah, was it um, <laughs> It was fantastic. It was definitely, um, look, we knew because of our results at World Championships, we knew we came out of that as the, the top ranked team going into the Commonwealth Games. So we knew we were in a really good place, but um, you know, anything can happen on the day that's sport. Um, and that's what I love about sport is that, you know, it's anyone's game. Um, and, you know, it, I think, I think that was great. Like it meant that we went into, well, into Commonwealth Games really confident. We knew what we were capable of and um, we executed that. Where do you keep that uh, Commonwealth Games gold medal these days? Oh, it's terrible. It's in my bedside drawer. <laughs> it's still in its box, but it is yet to be framed or <laughs> something. But it's, yeah, it's in a safe place in my bedside drawer. <laughs> I'm glad it's not in storage or something like that. That's yeah, good yeah, no, no. <laughs> it's sort of with my passport. So, you know, they're always you know, they're in a safe place. <laughs> 2011 uh, World Championships, you said, uh, in Montpe Montpellier, France. That enabled you to qualify for the Olympic Games in London 2012. Yeah. So at that, at that moment, where, was that when you knew you would be going to London or was there anything that you needed to officially make the team? Yeah, so um, I guess every sport has got a different qualification process to, um, to qualify for the Olympics and there's often lots of different stages. Um, for me, the, um, the hurdle I had to jump was that at the uh, World Championships, I needed to come out as the highest ranked um, athlete from the Oceania region. Um, so that's basically Australia, New Zealand and all of the um, surrounding islands and nations. Um, and so I knew that that's what I had to achieve um, and, and that's what I did. So coming out of that competition, I was the highest ranked athlete, but you know, it wasn't formally announced until a few months later. So although we sort of ticked that box, um, there was a little bit of relief and there was a little bit of reassurance, but it wasn't 100% guaranteed um, until that was sort of more formally announced. So I, I did know within a few months afterwards, um, and that was, I think, you know, by, I remember by Christmas time, I knew. So I had a good sort of eight months leading into the London Olympics where I, you know, I knew I had qualified, which is quite different. You know, a lot of sports, they know only a few weeks out. Um, and so the, the preparation is quite different knowing so far in advance. If you've just tuned in, we're talking to Janine Murray, the 2012 London Olympian and 2010 Commonwealth Games gold medalist. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat and also let us know where you're listening from or tuning in from. We always love to hear hear that. And then uh, now is actually a very good point to move into the London 2012 Games. What are your memories of the bit, the actual getting on there on the ground, the arrival at the Olympic Athletes Village, the opening ceremony? Just take us through all those fun bits. Yeah, so um, I guess, you know, we, we all sit and we watch the Olympics and we sort of soak up the atmosphere from our couches at home and um, we get to read about um, all those exciting things like the Athletes' Village and I was super excited for all of that, but actually my reality was quite different and that's okay. Um, 
I the the Olympics is obviously spread out over two weeks, um, and different sports are um, run over over that period. And uh, rhythmic gymnastics is always on the last three days <laughs> of the Olympics, along with the marathon. Um, and so I. Um, Part of my preparation for the games was to try to make it um, as much as I wanted to soak up that atmosphere and to really feel like I was living and breathing the Olympics. So much of it was also to try and make it seem like um, a normal competition, to make it seem like I had been there before. It wasn't anything out of the norm. And that was mostly just for my um, for my nerves and my confidence. Um, and so we didn't go into the the village straight away um i actually went to france to train for a week beforehand so that i could acclimatize um and it is a it is a big adjustment like flying from perth to to london is massive so we flew perth to london london to France um, and a lot of the times that we went to Europe for competition we were more often on that sort of eastern side of Europe so we went to Russia and Bulgaria quite a lot um, but that extra distance made a massive difference so it was really important that I got there quite well in advance and had time to acclimatize and France was really nice proximity to London and I'll never forget my very first training in France where we'd got off the plane. We thought we'd just go to the gym, have a bit of a stretch, maybe do a few skills. And I was so jet lagged and so tired that I'll never forget Crassie saying to me, and that's my coach. She just said, it doesn't look like you've done a day of gymnastics in your life. <laughs> and I said, that's not very good because I'm about to compete at the Olympics in like 10 days time. She goes, I think we should just go home and have a good sleep. And you'll be much better tomorrow. And, and she was right. So I was really grateful that we, we had that extra time for me to acclimatize, to find my legs again. Um, and we trained there for a week. We then went to London. We did all of the check-in to the village. I got all of my gear, bags and bags and bags of stuff. Um, and we stayed in the athlete village for, I think, one night. And then we moved to um, a hotel that was closer to my venue. So um, I think so much of the Olympics is that they want to host, or uh, the host nation wants to show um, their country and their you know, iconic venues. And so the sports were really scattered around, not just London, but actually a good part of England. Um, and my competition venue was at Wembley Arena, which is kind of like on the other side of London to where the athlete village is. So, you know, there was the option that I could stay in the athlete village for the whole um, period of the Olympics, but it would mean that we'd have to battle the traffic to get across London every day to train, to compete. And I just didn't want to run that risk that I might be stuck in a traffic jam on my competition day, um, which did actually happen to the athletes that decided to, um, to stay in the village. They were late on the first day of competition to their warm up. And I was really relieved that we just went, you know what, as much as this is the Olympics and this is going to be the biggest event um, in my career, we just wanted to treat it like it was any normal competition. We just stayed in um, just a hotel close to the venue along with a lot of the other athletes. Um, and it was, it was perfect. And then after my event, I just had one other night in the village as well. So a little bit different to what I probably had dreamt of. Um, but, you know, it was, it was a sacrifice that I had to make and I'm really glad I did. It sounds very smart. A good strategy. You know, you don't want to be having to take the tube to go to the Olympic competition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A question from two people, actually. So this was a popular question. Uh, Lauren Tumbles and Monica Costa. Um, did the crowd make you nervous or excited? How did you manage that for the Olympic Games? Yeah, look, I think... Um... I think I had learnt to actually not um, not hear the crowd, um, and I know that's difficult. Um, and I and I think everybody's different. So you know, there's athletes that will feed off of the energy from the crowd. Um, that you know, I think having, for example, like a home Olympic Games or Commonwealth Games, like they had, you know, the most recent Commonwealth Games is something that's really special when you've got the crowd behind you. Um, 
But for me, I was much better if I didn't allow that to distract me. So, you know, from the moment I heard my name called um, onto the competition floor, um, I'd learned to sort of silence, silence that. And then you only, I would only really hear the crowd at the very end. So once, you know, once I'd left the floor again. So um, whether it made me excited or whether it made me nervous, I'm not really sure. Um, I, I'd sort of learned to block them out if I caught the apparatus or if I did something fantastic and they would cheer, if I'd made a mistake and maybe you hear them gasp, you know, I, I didn't hear any of that. Um, and and um, I think it's probably something that I um, really worked very hard to do because I knew that the crowd could have the potential of making me quite nervous. Two questions from Shella Bear. Uh, one of them is, uh, what's your favourite question? And uh, Not your favourite question, favourite <laughs> competition. <laughs> what is your favourite question? Uh, what's your favourite competition and favourite leotard? Oh, thanks, Shalabha. Um So favourite competition um, oh, would, would have to be the, the Commonwealth Games. Um, I... Uh, as much as the Olympics is something that I'm incredibly proud of, um, we worked very hard to make that, as I said, as as normal an event as possible. And I think we achieved that in almost making it not a non-event, but just um, it just wasn't I, I needed to make it um, um, not the Olympics in a sense. Um, and so the Commonwealth Games was different because um there wasn't so much pressure on, on me as an individual. As I said, it was more about me as a member of a team. Um, and we were an awesome team with Danielle Prince and Nazmi Johnston. And um, we, you know, we made it really fun. Um, it was fun to be together. It was fun to compete together. Um, it was fun to win a medal together. Um, and I think it was just all around, you know, Australia did, brilliantly at that Commonwealth Games as well. So there was a, a really awesome atmosphere in the village amongst all the different sporting teams because um, we, we just, we did really well. So definitely my favorite competition um, without, without any doubt. Um, and my favorite leotard, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I would think my ball leotard from the Olympics. Um, yeah, my ball or my club's leotard from the Olympics. So the ball had yeah, so lots each, of bright. Each one, each one had a different, different leotard. leotard. Yeah, yeah. So, so every apparatus um, a different leotard, um, and they were leotards that were specifically made for me for the Olympics. So same thing going into the Commonwealth Games. We had four new leotards that we'd never worn before. They were made just for the Commonwealth Games, and then same for the Olympics. So um, my ball leotard was lots of bright colours, um, which was quite different for me. A lot of my leotards were a little bit more on the darker side. Um, and then my club's leotard um, was reds and golds. And again, just really different for me. So they would be, yeah, I think they're my favourite. A question that's just come in from Molly and Philo Kelly. Do you have any superstitions when it comes to performing your best? Um, yes. And I think... Um, I know some people think superstitions are um, are strange or maybe a little weird or I don't know. But for me, I think superstitions are part of creating a routine. Um, and so much of that routine is about trying to find um, some normality to the to the competition to make it feel like you've um, walked those steps before. Um, so I was very superstitious about what I would eat on the day of competition um, because you don't want something that, you know, you don't want to eat something that's going to upset you. <laughs> um, and so I would always have tinned tuna <laughs> on the day of competition. Um, and the second superstition is I would always use the same changing cubicles. So once I had picked a cubicle, for the competition day, that was a cubicle I would always go into to change my leotard every time. Um, and the third thing was I always had this little pink flamingo, which I was given when I was a very young gymnast. And that that pink flamingo, which is called Pinky, 
very original, um, came along with me to every competition and my coach Crassie would always hold my pink flamingo. So that was, that was it. That was just part of creating, I guess, a, a guess a routine. Um, and it just, it just made things feel like, um, yeah, ma made things feel like you'd walk, like I'd, I'd walked those steps before. Like I had done this, I had done this before, just like you do in training, you repeat skills over and over and over again so that they become ingrained in your body. They become second nature and it just becomes a routine. Um, and part of that sort of competition day is also about creating that same routine. A question from Eva Kirith, who is the gym, current Gymnastics WA yes. Athlete of the Year, Senior International Trampoline Gymnast. Superstar. <laughs> superstar asking another superstar a question, and hers is, do you ever compete in group? I did actually um, when I was um, when I was a younger gymnast. So, um, oh, I think... Oh, how old would I? Have? I I would have been ten, I think. Um, which I know sounds like I was very young, but um, I was the equivalent of what we had was was pre junior, so I wasn't quite junior age yet, um, and I was still living in Zimbabwe, and we had um, an international competition that was held between a lot of the southern African nations, um, and we went to Namibia and I competed in a group there, um, but I had to go up an age group. So I actually competed in a junior group, even though I was a pre-junior. Um, and our group won, won that competition, which was really exciting. Um, so yeah, that was actually the only time that I have done group was when I was much younger. And to be honest, I preferred being an individual <laughs> athlete. Um, I'm not saying I'm not a team player, but I don't like the, um, I don't like letting other people down. I'm okay to let myself down um, because I know that, um, you know, I know that if I've, you know, where, where I've gone wrong, I can work on that and I can improve on myself, um, but I don't like letting other people down. So um, group is, I respect a lot of people that, that do group. It's not, it's not easy. Another question from Sheila Bear. Uh, if you didn't do rhythmic gymnastics, which gym sport mm -hmm. would you have done? Oh, um, I think I... I went to recent, not recently, a couple of years ago, I went to um, World Championships for um, ACRO um, as, as the team physiotherapist. Um, and... Um, I'm really disappointed in myself that I actually hadn't watched a lot of ACRO before going to that World Championships. And it was an eye-opener for me because I thought it was absolutely phenomenal um, what they were able to do. And um, I'm not sure I was, would be capable of it, but I would like to be able to do ACRO. <laughs> I was going to say I don't think I've got the strength to do artistic in terms of upper body strength, like women's artistic. Um, but um thinking about that I probably don't have the upper body strength to do acro either <laughs> but I'd like to be able to do it <laughs> acro is absolutely spectacular it's to incredible watch. yeah incredible and there's a lot of elements that are quite similar to rhythmic as well there's a lot of the dance elements um a lot of the artistic elements that are that are very similar to rhythmic that I loved um but the the strength and some of the skills that they're able to do is just just phenomenal. Yeah, loved it. A question from Olena Komenko. Do you still have the flamingo? <laughs> I do still have the flamingo. Yes, yes. The flamingo is still with me. <laughs> this is a really important uh, part, I think, and really interesting about yourself too. So uh, we're going to move into your professional life now um, yeah. because you were able to integrate your studies with all of the experiences that you've just talked about in your gymnastics career. Can you tell us about how you've done that and your work as a, uh, you work in physiotherapy and Pilates? Yeah, so I, um, I was pretty adamant when I left high school that I wanted to go to uni, even though um, I was still, or I was probably just going into that point in my gymnastics career when I really needed to knuckle down and get all the hours in, in the gym. Um, but there was a part of me that still wanted to be able to do um, all the things my friends outside of 
Jim were doing. Um, and, you know, my, my parents definitely didn't say that, you know, you need to study or study was more important. Um, they always said to me, you know, you can only do gymnastics for a certain period of your life and you can, you know, you've, your next career, which inevitably you will have, um, you know, you're going to have that for a very long time. So there was really no rush or no pressure for me to go straight into uni after school, but I really wanted to. Um, and I was, and I still believe, um, you know, having work life sport balance is really important. Um, so I went into sports science when I first left um, high school and I ambitiously started full time um, and then year by year I gradually reduced to part time um, and so it took me I think four and a half years to do my sports science degree um, which I did and I graduated you know a few weeks after I came home from the Olympics so um, it was really nice to have that and you know it was a really good adjunct to my training like what what better thing to study than sports science whilst um, whilst being an elite athlete. Um, I learned, yeah, like I learned so much about, um, you know, all those extra things that sports science does and, you know, we could integrate that into my training, which was fantastic. Um, and then when I finished the Olympics, I knew at that point what I wanted to do after gymnastics and, and that was that I wanted to study physio. So I went on and did my postgrad in physio and at the same time um, did a lot of Pilates training. Um, and that's where I am now. I work full time as a physiotherapist and part of my work is I integrate Pilates as a rehab tool for a lot of my patients. So can you underscore the importance of this for athletes? Because there will be athletes watching, tuning in now, and I guess the importance of those support services around them and how they should go about seeking the best physiotherapists or Pilates and, and the different things that they can do. Yeah, look, I think um, for me there is no doubt that um, I could have gotten... Um, to the events that I did uh, without support. Um, you know, there, there is, you know, every gymnast has got um, themselves and you've got a responsibility to yourself um, and you've got, you know, and you've got your coach and you've got your training facility. And I think, you know, I think that's the, the sort of the basic where your coach is a support, you know, is a support person um, as well. Um, and, and coaching is a massive part of, you um, of developing you as an athlete um, but for me the additional things that were really really important were uh, nutrition um, exercise physiology so that was a lot of uh, working with me to um, integrate a lot of additional cardio into my training um, so swimming and cycling um, to to mostly just made, ensure that I guess I was tackling all the aspects of the sport, not just focusing on my skills and my routines. Um, definitely physiotherapy. Um, I worked with some really fantastic physios in Perth. And, you know, I think now being a physio, every athlete is... Um, either carrying an injury or as, as unfortunate as it sounds, you're, you're waiting for an injury, whether that's going to be something that is um, something that you couldn't prevent. You know, you can't prevent sometimes spraining your ankle or coming off of a piece of equipment um, awkwardly or, you know, a club landing on your head or on your hand or, you know, you can't prevent those things. Um, but there is a lot of injuries that you can prevent. And I think in gymnastics, a lot of the overuse injuries from just the nature of training, the sport demands that you practice and you repeat skills multiple times. Um, and that can lead to a lot of overuse injuries. And so I think that's where physio is really important to help um, prevent some of those injuries. Um, and then the other support services for me that were really big was um, definitely sports psych as well. Um, having that, um, I, I started seeing a sports psych when I probably was about 15. 
Um, we initially in our training center were doing group sessions and then I decided that I probably could get a little bit more out of the session if I did that on my own. Um, and that was certainly something that became a very big part of what I would call my training because we obviously have our physical training when we're in the gym and gosh, we spend hours in the gym perfecting our skills, but actually we also have to train our mind and um, that mental strength is a massive component. Um, and, you know, I, I know it's definitely a challenging area for a lot of young athletes to want to um, talk to a sports psychologist about the things that maybe make them nervous or make them um, excited or, or uh, you know, maybe are challenges or barriers to them in competition or out of competition. But once you can overcome that hurdle and you can work with somebody that um, is able to really connect with you, it, um, I think that was a, working with a sports psychologist was definitely a massive turning point for me in my, in my career. Are you working with any gymnasts at the moment or do you work with quite a few? Every now and then I see you at the gymnastics centre. It's always a pleasure to run into you. Uh, what's your yeah. involvement is the question, I guess. Yeah, look. Um, I am definitely still involved in gymnastics. Um, I work with some of our trampolining athletes who have been asking questions today, which is really <laughs> lovely. So I'm very fortunate to work with um, Eva Kerath, um and a couple of the other trampolining athletes like Lachlan Shellabear and Sarah Jones. Um, and then so, and then I also um, am very grateful to be able to work with some of our rhythmic gymnasts as well. Um, and that is, all of that is both within a physiotherapy sort of capacity and also in um, sort of Pilates based rehab as well with those athletes. And I will speak from, from experience that I have been to one of your anti-gravity yoga classes with uh, Karen Murray. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> executive director of the stuff away. So I guess one of these questions, uh, which came from a little birdie, is uh, where did you get your sports talent from? Was it from mum's side or dad's side? <laughs> Um, do you know what? Mum's not going to like to hear this. Um, but my dad is, my dad is, um, I would like to say a very athletic person. Dad was very good at a lot of different sports. Um, strangely as most men are, like most guys are pretty good at sport. Um, and, but I think, you know, mum was really good. Um, I think I, I know from what mum has said to me is that, you know, she would have loved to have done um, a lot of sports, but her parents maybe weren't able to take her to all the sports that she wanted to do um, and to be able to find time after work or after school to get her there and to pick her up and drop her off and which, um, you know, my, my mum definitely went out of her way to be able to give me those opportunities um, so that I could basically do um, any sport that I really wanted to. Um, and so whilst I think I got my sporting abilities from dad, mum really made that possible. <laughs> yeah, she is a legend. Actually, a <laughs> big rhythmic gymnast, uh, rhythmic gymnastics judge. So very she highly is, qualified. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Janine, this has been fantastic. Let's move to the round-off segment, which is our last three questions that we ask all of our guests. The first one is diet, because we know it's incredibly important, and we are sponsored by Healthway Go for Two and Five. So I am asking you, what is your approach to healthy eating, not, not just as a gymnast, but also now? Um, so in terms of um, definitely now I'm very fortunate. I don't have any dietary, um, allergies or intolerances. So I am lucky enough to eat anything and everything. Um, but I think for me, the biggest thing in terms of, of a healthy diet is just a little bit of everything in moderation. Um, there's, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, definitely. Like I love my fruit and veg, but I also love my ice cream and I also love my chocolate, but it's got to be balanced, doesn't it? Um, and it has to be, for me, um, relative to the amount of exercise, like the amount I'm, I'm putting out, I've got to put in as well. So I think a big thing is thinking of food as a fuel. And if I want to go and run, 
20 Ks, I've got to, I've got to get enough fuel on board to get me to do 20 Ks. Um, same thing if I'm injured and I can't go and run my 20 Ks, then I probably can't, you know, I can't smash the spaghetti. Maybe got to, <laughs> got to have something else instead, but yeah. Everything in moderation for me is, is a healthy diet. I like that you mentioned. I like that you mentioned exercise because we'll, yeah. we're going to interrupt the roundup segment quickly because the champion Eva Kirith has just asked <laughs> another question. And it's, what's your favourite form of exercise other than rhythmic? Now that you've retired, yeah, um, that was a really challenging thing for me to find when I um, retired from gymnastics. Um, and I think the thing that was challenging for me is I'd never had to in my childhood, in my teenage years and in my early adult um, think about doing exercise, like finding time to exercise because doing, doing a sport, doing gymnastics, I was um, just, you know, that, that was just part and parcel of my day. So when I retired from gym, it was really hard to go, oh, I've got to find 30 minutes of exercise, um, even though I had an abundance of time on my hands. Um, and it was difficult to find something that, yeah, got my heart rate up, built strength. Um, but also I enjoyed doing like it was, you know, um, rhythmic has got so many, um, so many elements to it that are fun, that are beautiful, that are creative. Um, and it was really hard to find a form of exercise that ticked all those boxes. Um, but going back to what you said before about doing some athletics when I was younger, um, running just works for me. And so now I... Um, I just, I love running. So it's my, it's my go-to. I do a bit of yoga. I do a bit of Pilates. You know, I'm always happy to go out for a hike, but um, I'd much rather run from A to B than walk from, from A to B. And a bit, I'm just going to grab my phone charger before I run out of battery. So you're going to get a micro tour of the flat. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll ask the next question while we're at it. Um, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Um, the best piece of advice before I lose battery. Um, apart from always charge your phone. From always, <laughs> yeah, always charge your phone. Um, <laughs> would, it's only because I've got like an iPhone 6, like I'm totally out of the times. And so <laughs> I, it doesn't hold its battery. <laughs> it was fully charged. Um, best piece of advice that would have been given to me just a few weeks before going to the Olympics. Um, and her name has escaped me, but she was a um, very high level high jumper um, that competed in the Olympics in the early 90s. And she just said to me, um, she'd been to a couple of Olympics. And so she was speaking from experience. And she just said to me on the day of your competition, you are going to be nervous, um, but just know that so is everybody else. Like, and she just gave the example that Usain Bolt is going to be nervous on the day of his competition, and that's okay. So, um, I think I think a lot of like I think a lot of gymnasts and I think a lot of athletes always you know always worry about their nerves, and that was definitely something that I learned could either. Um, impact my performance positively or negatively depending on um how um how i used those nerves but it was just really reassuring to go oh yeah everybody's going to be nervous and i and i think that would be definitely advice i'd give to a lot of young young athletes is that it's okay to be nervous because the person that's on the floor or the person that's waiting to go out into the competition arena is also really nervous um but it's kind of how you um, harness those nerves, I guess. We'll, we'll interrupt the round off again because there's been another good question and it links into goal setting, I think, and it's from Elena Komenko. Uh, was it your dream to go to the Olympics when you were younger? You know, I think I, think I kind of alluded to it earlier when I said um, I didn't really have massive expectations of myself. Um, I never as a little kid kind of dreamt of, of, you know, reaching the Olympics. And I think that's partly because I wasn't really sure I could achieve that. Like I wasn't someone that set really um, big goals. I like to set um, 
small goals and just work my way up and see kind of where that path <laughs> led me. So I was very much, you know, as I sort of said, you know, world championships was kind of like a stepping stone to the next event or a national championships was a stepping stone to qualifying to something else. And so, you know, certainly within, you know, a cycle or two out of the Olympics, it definitely became um, a goal. It definitely became something that I started to to really believe I could qualify for and I and I could go to. But I'd say as um, as a young kid, I kind of just wanted to enjoy the journey um, and just kind of see what you know what competition I could qualify and where that would lead me to lead me to next. The final question, uh, Janine, is uh, what's your happiest moment in gymnastics? Oh, there's lots. <laughs> um, but I think probably um, going back, I think it was Eva's question about what was, you know, what was the best competition. I, I think my happiest moment would be um, the Commonwealth Games in 2010. Um, it was... Um, it's always it's always awesome to win. It is always really nice to win a gold medal, but it was also just a, it was just a really fun competition. As I said, it had a really aw awesome atmosphere. You don't get to go to a multi sport competition all the time. You know, often when you go away, it's just gymnastics or it's just rhythmic gymnastics um, for the Commonwealth Games for the Olympics. Um, for some like World Uni Games, they're multi-sport events, so you get to have those interactions with, you know, athletes from um, not only other countries but other sports. Um, and the Com Games in 2010 was really special, um, and so that would definitely be my my highlight. Janine, thank you so much for your insightful answers to all these questions, and thank you to all the, the fans for their fantastic positive questions and for tuning in so this has been a really fun starcast and we can't thank you for your time oh thank you thanks so much for having me along no problems and if everyone we can't wait to bring you some um, some more starcasts in the future make sure you stay tuned to our gymnastics wa social media and we'll let you know who the the next guests are but um, big thank you to janine murray and good night to everyone keep healthy and keep happy. See you, Janine.